This video has been on my mind for over three years and it's finally time to make it. Well, hello there, I'm Detroit. Three days after this video comes out is when I will defend my PhD in front of a jury and officially be titled a doctor in condensed matter physics. This means a couple of things. First thing is that I'm very, very stressed. It's gonna be fine, of course, but I can't help it. Second thing is I'm not gonna have time to make another video in the next few days. Now I don't have the time and right after my defense I'm going on holidays with my family so I don't know when the next video will be. One thing is for sure, I'm not gonna make another drawing before the defense. Third thing, since my PhD is ending and I don't know yet what I'll do afterwards, now is the time to talk about a specific part of my job, which is cryogenics. I love the cryogenics aspect of my job, so this is a lesson in cryogenics, and you'll understand what I'm drawing in a second. What is cryogenics? It simply means low temperature, in the media, we hear about freezing dead people to thaw them at a later date when medicine has evolved. Well, I'm not doing that, but I do work with low temperatures. What sort of cold are we talking about? Well, ambient temperature is usually considered to be, let's say, around 20 degrees Celsius, and water freezes at 0 Celsius. That's kinda cold. In universal units, 0 Celsius is 273.15 kelvins. So let's get colder. Most of the air in the atmosphere is made of nitrogen. Nitrogen and air becomes liquid at 77 kelvins. It's still quite hot for me. Helium becomes liquid at 4.2 kelvins. Already we're talking about minus 269 Celsius. So we're quite far from temperatures that humans can bear. In fact, outer space is at a temperature of 4 Kelvin. So far, we've reached the lowest naturally occurring temperatures in the universe. I'm approximating, of course, but you get the idea. To reach temperatures below 4 Kelvin, you have a few solutions that can only be achieved in a lab. First, you can reduce the pressure. By using a pump to reduce the pressure of liquid helium, you can reach 1.2 Kelvin. By mixing in different isotopes of helium, or different types in the right quantity, then pumping on it, you can reach even lower temperatures. This principle is known as dilution. The experiment I've been working with for three years uses a dilution refrigerator to reach lower temperatures. My fridge goes down to 50 millikelvins. That's 50 thousands of a kelvin, or 0.05 kelvin. How cold is that? It's only 50 millikelvin above absolute zero. Room temperature being 300 Kelvin, it's 20 times colder than the surface of the sun. Reaching 50 millikelvins, on the other hand, means reaching temperatures 10,000 times colder than room temperature. Comparatively, on a logarithmic scale, our room temperature is so much closer to the temperature of the sun than it is my experiment. So my dilution fridge, that I'm currently drawing, is capable of reaching that kind of temperature. Before we get into the how, and I describe the various elements that make this beauty of cryogenic engineering, let's talk about the why. Why on earth would one need such low temperatures? Temperature is basically energy. The hotter something is, the stronger do the particles making it vibrate. So when a scientist looks at matter, temperature sometimes makes properties hard to see. If you want to look at how one atom behaves to understand it, and that atom is all over the place full of energy, it's hard to observe. A good analogy would be with sound. Somebody sends you an audio message, whispering something, and you're at an EDM concert. Where you currently are, there is no way to understand what the message is. So you get out of the concert, you reduce the excess noise, and you turn up the volume. Well, for condensed matter physics, temperature is just like an EDM concert. We need to lower the temperature because it produces so much noise, we can't see anything interesting. And when that temperature is sufficiently low, then we get all sorts of fun matter things. Examples would be superconductivity. Superconductivity can be seen in a lot of materials, but only at low temperature. By understanding how and why it exists, then we can design materials where superconductivity exists at higher temperature, then a bit higher and higher and higher, 
until eventually maybe we will have room temperature superconductors we can use in everyday life. That is basically my job as a soon to be doctor in physics. I am studying matter in very specific conditions of really low temperature and high magnetic field, which is also a very important variable to study matter in its purest state. As a side note, the magnetic field I'm applying for my measurements can reach up to 16 tesla, which is 250,000 times stronger than the Earth's magnetic field. Under these conditions, I measure different stuff, such as how electricity flows through a material, or how heat dissipates, or how its size changes under field and temperature. And then I try to understand what my measurements mean. That's research finding something and then trying to understand it, and then share your results. Back to the dilution refrigerator. You can understand that it's really, really hard to reach temperatures such as 50 mK. In fact, it is so low that just doing a measurement heats up the whole thing. No matter what you measure, you need a wire with an electrical signal. But just sending electricity through a wire heats up the wire. So you need special wires and really low currents and so on. In fact, at these low temperatures, having light on the setup heats it due to natural radiation. Vibrations also heat the setup. Basically, anything does it, and so you need a lot of cooling power. First, to cool from room temperature to cryogenic temperatures. This one is simple. The whole thing you see is plunged into a bath of liquid helium at 4 Kelvin. Technically, what I'm drawing is hermetically sealed in a metallic sock with vacuum inside. In really high vacuum, there is close to no particle around and so heat doesn't conduct between the helium bath and the setup itself. Because for the temperatures I'm interested in, liquid helium is too hot. Ok, so on the outside is liquid helium. It cools down all the cables and the structure of the dilution fridge itself. Then, on the right side you can see there, there is a first plateau which is connected to a small metallic box called the 1K pot. A tiny tube connects the inside of this box to the helium bath. On the other side of the tube is a very large pump that is obviously not shown here. This small box takes, in effect, a little amount of liquid helium, and by pumping on it, it cools the whole stage down to 1 Kelvin, hence the name, 1K pot. This stage further cools all the wires and separates the colder stages from the hotter ones, acting as a screen. The next cold stage is the steel stage the steel being represented by a small cylinder just above the large spiral coil. This is too connected to a very large and powerful pump, but the helium inside is this special mixture of different helium isotopes that is in its own circuit loop. The steel is connected to the exchanger, the large coil, and to the coldest stage, the mixing chamber. This is the leftmost gold-colored stage in this drawing. By pumping on the helium mixture, a part of the helium will evaporate in the still, which will force the helium to go through the exchanger from the mixing chamber. In that chamber, replacing the evaporated helium by new atoms will need heat to occur and so the mixing chamber will absorb the heat from the rest of the setup, therefore cooling it. Maybe I should have started with that. Cold is actually not a thing. Cold is just the absence of heat. In order to cool down something, you can't add cold, you have to remove heat. What my experiment does is exactly the same thing as the fridge in your kitchen, just on a whole different scale. But anyway, I won't get into much more detail than that. It's quite complicated to understand. It took me two years of using it before I understood the experiment completely. It's completely alright if you don't understand. It's not like it's useful in your everyday life anyway. Because my setup is fully experimental and homemade, over the last 3 years I made a lot of repairs on this dilution fridge. Now I know it by heart. I replaced a lot of parts, I changed the wirings a couple times. Some of the wires I drew at the end are made of copper, others are superconducting to avoid heating. I think this setup has about 140 pieces of wire of different length, glued or taped with special materials in various parts to cool them, and soldered on gold-plated tracks at various points. It has 8 thermometers to ensure all the stages are functioning properly and so on. Heating elements too for when you need to put the setup back to room temperature. The whole setup functions using 3 pumps that take up a whole room, and about 12 different instruments such as 
amplifiers, multimeters, controllers, and computers of all sorts. Cooling this thing and reaching 50 millikelvins on what sample I'm measuring takes more than three full days. Each step of the cooling process takes hours, and you need to action a dozen valves in the right order, make sure all the wires are all connected and the vacuum is holding, etc. It's a long and arduous process, but in order to reach otherwise untainable conditions, this is what you need. It makes sense that it's not as easy as pointing your finger. In any case, this has been my daily work for three years. I've been wanting to explain a tiny bit of cryogenics for you for three years, but I've never got around to do it. Now that I'm finishing this job in a couple days, it's the right time to make this video. This is a goodbye from me to this experimental setup I've poured sweat, blood and tears on. I hope you enjoyed this drawing, and maybe you understood a couple things about my PhD studies. Let me know in the comments if you enjoyed this type of content that goes further than just drawing. Subscribe to this channel because Detroit is officially going to be a doctor by the next time I talk to you. Bye!